Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, listeners all over the world, welcome back to another edition of the Anything Wrestling Podcast. We are back here today with another episode. It has been a while since we've recorded, so we hope that everybody is doing well and everybody is safe from everything that's been going on all over the world. Today, however, unfortunately, it is not a triple threat. The commish couldn't join us today, but today we do have the Shant and Dan the Man. Dan, how are we doing? Just peachy. Better than, uh, you know, WWE. Isn't everyone. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's been a while since we've done this, and I feel like a lot of things have changed. Some things have stayed the same. And I thought that it was just about that time that we do a State of the WWE Address. We usually try to do this once every six months. Sometimes we do once a year, just depending on time and circumstance. But today we want to just talk about the product that is WWE. Uh, We might even make reference to a few other companies like AEW or New Japan or TNA. Um, but, uh, before we really get into specifics, I just kind of wanted to go over just a brief introduction of what we're feeling of the product currently, what our standpoint is on the talent, the storylines, and just the reg- the direction that things are going in. So, um, Dan, if you want to start us out, just a uh, very few opening thoughts about what do you think about the product right now? And, uh, for starters, I know for a fact that last time you said, uh, you were not going to switch over to Peacock uh, from WWE Network to Peacock. So I don't know if that still stands, but uh, what do you think of the product right now? Well, I would like to start, first and foremost, with some words from the commish, if, the, if you wouldn't mind. Go ahead. All right. So <clears throat> the following is from your friendly, humble, loyal, brilliant, amazing, cunning, wise, literary, and sometimes not as articulate, but well-advised advocate of the Anything Wrestling podcast. I take that he wrote that and that you didn't just make that up? Correct. This is uh, his his very humble, uh, uh, very modest uh, branding of himself. Anyway, (laughs) starting with uh, the, the current situation um as a fan of professional wrestling since the days of Shawn michaels bret hart to seth rollins roman reigns the dynamic has constantly changed when it is in regards to the lineup roster of superstars that are in the wwe what has constantly changed in the dynamic is the viewership in the eras we've all managed to live through from the golden age to attitude era through ruthless aggression pg era and the reality era and what i now like to see uh dubbed as the rebirth era dan shot i'm sure you guys have a different name for it but this is my opinion on the matter the current era hasn't been appealing at all the sad part is this era for the last two years has driven me further and further away to watching all elite wrestling more and more Wow. The only way I'm able to enjoy WWE is watching whatever main pay-per-view, Royal Rumble, WrestleMania, SummerSlam, and Survivor Series. And that's sad. The WWE has lost my interest in regard to watching its staple shows, Raw, SmackDown, main event. The only thing worth watching is NXT. Thank you again, Triple H, for taking over. Wow. So that's his, that's his piece on that. Now, what I will say, uh, jumping back in... Uh, as far as the Peacock thing goes, um, I actually uh, gained access to Peacock through a cable subscription uh, without having to pay extra. So nice. I have access to it, but it's not like I went out of my way to get it. All right. Um, my overarching opinion on the on the matter is that I, I do think that the WWE's product presentation, uh, delivery, uh, and especially the way that they carry and support themselves has been on a steady decline probably since mm, right before the pandemic started. Yeah. Um, more so, more so than it already was like, we were always kind of shaky on stuff, but, um, and, and you can only give, but you can only give so much leeway. Because, okay, you didn't have an audience, you were in the Thunderdome, whatever. Uh, But, for me, 
I, I even before they switched over to Peacock, I was sporadic at best when it came to looking at the highlights on YouTube. Yeah. I, I would I would focus in on specific performers who I really uh, cared about, and those were things like uh, when The Fiend, Alexa, and Randy were feuding, or when Drew won the title initially, uh, because they had really interesting stories going. Even Roman, when he started with the, the head of the table gimmick. But as time's gone on, uh, all of those have cooled on me. And like, for example, I'll just use Alexa. I don't care about where they're going with it because it's such a slow burn thing. It's, it, and this is a, this is a symptom of what we've talked about time and time again, is that they kind of book week to week with no end game in sight, which is a terrible structure for running a television show or, creative outlet like that because if you don't know where you're going yeah how are you going to keep people engaged so we've had two three weeks of alexa and Shayna baszler like interacting and we had that the little mirror gimmick thing and i've watched a, a handful of videos from what what culture and other other people are they just for lack of a better term shat on that entire segment yeah <laughs> and even with head of the table, Roman himself is fine, but we we've spent eight months following this character with rematch after rematch, and oh, is uh, Jay going to join him? And then Jay joins him, and now Jimmy's here, and we're basically rehashing that story yeah. now that we have the other brother back, and it's it's just terrible long term booking. Yeah, which I don't I don't know if they know how to do anymore. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I'll jump in. Opening thoughts, uh, without trying to go too like specific into a storyline or a superstar or whatever. I guess I concur with both of you guys. I, I mean, I guess we can now call this the COVID era because you know WWE is still performing, but it's under COVID restrictions. I used to think that COVID was the big reason as to why WWE was on this decline, even though before the pandemic, they were still on a decline. But like, I'm not going to get too specific into this, but I will just say that I watched the last AEW pay-per-view, which was all or nothing, and they did a bang up job of having all their main event talent on that card. Everybody that's been having momentum, picking up momentum, you know, has been on, you know, all the shows, you know, week in and week out, ha was on that card. And I thought to myself and I said, you have every single talent that everybody's familiar with, whether they're AEW grown or, w or former WWE superstar, Everybody was on the card. Everybody participated. They got all their matches in. They got all their storylines in. So it's not so much a COVID thing. It's more of a they don't know how to book thing. And I do agree with that. The slow burn thing that you talked about. I actually think it's either that or something, you know, gets done way too quickly. Like out of nowhere. Um, and then it eventually dies down. But overall opinion about what I think about the product, I, I, I say this every single time we do a State of the WWE address, but it's truly how I feel. We are at an all-time low. Like, I sometimes, like before, I would say maybe six months or a year ago, right when Raw would happen, I would go online and see the highlights. Now I let a solid two or three days pass by until I finally remember that, oh yeah, I got to go see the highlights to see what happened this past week. So yeah. if that's any indication, it's like I have, I don't have as much, re like there's not as much excitement anymore to go back and see the highlights. As a matter of fact, it's kind of the opposite. But um, yeah, that's just kind of where I am right now with the product. Meaningless storylines, things that are either slow burning or get burned way too quick. Um, you know, talent not being used, even though they're right there under, you know, uh, the roster, you know, getting paid. 
uh, some of which were let go, and we're going to get into that in just a second. But yeah, just an uh, introductory you know, statement. Um, product is at an all-time low, uh, and you know, half the highlights, half of their clips on YouTube, I don't even watch anymore. Like if it's a backstage segment or if it's a match between like one cruiserweight and another cruiserweight, I don't even click on the video anymore just because I know it's just a, a precious waste of time. But um, now that we've kind of gone the introductory phase out of the way, I think it would be appropriate if we talk about the talent that was recently released because I think that there was one or two, like there's usually, when a, when a crop of talent gets released, there are some people that you kind of expect and you're not so shocked on, but then there is the counterpart where there are there's maybe one or two people that get released and you're like, whoa, where, where did this come from? It's kind of out of left field. So... Dan, if you could read for us um, the the talent that was released, and if you want to segue into Kamish's thoughts, then we can kind of go from there. Yeah, that works. Um, so uh, we're going from more or less May. Uh, I'm going to omit a couple of names with all due respect to them. Uh, but for the sake of brevity, Jessman Duke, uh, Alexander Wolf, Velveteen Dream, Santana Garrett, Lana, Murphy, Ruby Riot, Alistair Black, and Braun Strowman. Um, I'll go ahead and I'll read Commission's thing and then we can open up the floor. Yes. <clears throat> if I've been driven away to the competition, that alone should be saying something. It should say that creative storytelling, booking, and the product itself in the WWE is repulsively bad. I hate to say it like that, but it's the truth. They're promoting their mainstay superstars that are guaranteed money uh, flowing in and ignoring all the great talent they used to have. Yes, they have. there have been strong cutbacks, which I understand is due to budget cuts, but when you cut talent in the middle of a possible comeback, Aleister Black, for example... You are gutting the product and turning it into crap. This recent wave of firings, and including last year's firings, have shown that the old man is tired of running his favorite business and is ready to sell to the highest bidder. I understand it can get expensive to pay people, Braun Strowman, for example, but when you cut superstars like Ruby Riot, Lana, and Chelsea Green, you're basically saying that it's only about the money and has nothing to do with the talent. You do not care for people's livelihoods, and take that into consideration. So, I'll segue straight from that into mine. Right. When I saw this wave of releases, the first name that I saw that initially surprised me um, was Braun. Yeah. Because he had been booked so highly on the card for so long. Granted, you had a couple of those start and stops like they do with, uh, I don't know, everybody. Everyone. But... Uh, from what I've read, it sounds like uh, one of the main reasons behind it is that Vince is higher on Omos than he is on Braun right now. Plus, Braun wanted a bunch of money. So basically, Vince said, eh, we got a new big guy. We don't need this one. And they cut him loose. But the one that seems to have caught pretty much everybody off guard was Aleister Black. And the main reason for that is because he had literally just come back. He was introducing this Dark Father character, and he'd been on TV for the, the two weeks prior to his actual firing Yeah. after they got him engaged with Big E. So everybody was like, wait, 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 wait a minute. Why him? Of all people, why him? Dan. Why would you release Aleister Black? Why? I was interested to see where, where they were going to go, because they had done a, like when they did the, the I stuff with Seth Rollins, oh my lord, I, I was like, what are you guys doing to him? You're just, you're, you're wrecking him again. And so then they brought this character back and he didn't even get off the ground. Uh, but then you've got Ruby, Ruby Riot, you've got Murphy who's making a buzz, Lana who, I mean, are, are we, that, that's going to sound bad, but are we are we really surprised? Because I mean, she she stuck around after Miro left, but 
well, that doesn't shock me. <laughs> um, I guess I'll jump in here. Yeah, I, I think Lana is probably one of those names who's like, again, with all due respect, like not to put one person over the other, but it's just if we're talking about TV time, booking and all that, Lana was just kind of being jerked around from one place on the card to the next. Uh, the makeshift team of her and Naomi was, it was, I guess, something to just sort of pass the time. Um, then you have Jasmine Duke, who uh, never even really made it to the main roster. And unfortunately, Dan, I think uh, it brings us less closer to the four versus four that you're always uh, hoping for. But, um, and then you kind of move down and you, you get into, into a little bit more of like the, the frequently booked uh, superstars. A Lister Black, like we talked about, um, which I felt like there there should always be a spot for someone like A Lister Black. I feel like that shouldn't be a superstar where you run out of ideas because always in wrestling, whether it's your Undertakers, whether it's your Bray Wyatt, you always kind of need that dark character who kind of who can sink into those depths, you know, for a storyline and performing purposes. And I always felt like he always had a very good presentation with his entrance, his promos, his finishing move, his fighting style. Um, his athletic ability. Like, he, he's a guy that you should have been able to easily justify holding on to as a, as a mid-card talent at, at, at least. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I wouldn't mind if he came in. You, we started off with, like, an Intercontinental Championship run, a U.S. run, maybe a tag team run if you can find the right guy. And then slowly segue him into, you know, main event uh, momentum. Yeah, upper mid card. Because right. that, that's, the, that's the other problem that they chronically have is that they'll lean so heavily on like five guys to be the top of the card. Which we frequently reference back to the Attitude Era. You had probably 15 guys you could cycle in at any point during the Attitude Era. Yeah. And that, that's what kept it fresh. And meanwhile, like not, like currently... And we'll go back a couple weeks. Uh, you had like Seth and Roman and Braun and Bobby Lashley and Drew, and that like I think those are really about it. Yeah, and I will say like um, I don't I don't know if you're following NXT. I try to as much as I can. I watch all the takeovers. There is a takeover going on this Sunday. It's it's another tribute to In Your House. Um, and they yeah. literally have a fatal five-way for the championship. I believe it's uh, Adam Cole, O'Reilly, uh, Pete Dunne, um, Karrion Cross, and one more person that I'm forgetting. But I think that NXT does a very good job of, like you said, Dan, kind of in the Attitude Era where you did have those 10 to 15 people. I feel like NXT has that too. Where maybe one second um, Adam Cole is in the title picture, then Finn Balor's in the title picture, then a Pete Dunne is in the title picture, and then, oh, we go back to Adam Cole, and then we go back to Finn Balor. Um, so they, they really have that good like transitional booking where we go from this guy to this guy, then this guy segues into this storyline, this guy goes into that storyline. Yeah, but I mean, capping off that list of releases, Braun Strowman, which... Uh, Equally as shocking as a Black for me personally, I honestly felt like, again, like you said, yeah, there was the start, stop, start, stop, the, you know, for every money in the bank, you know, cash in, there would be some atrocity that would take place. For every uh, championship that he won, there would be something else waiting, uh, you know, sort of in the background. But um, I, I don't, if that's the reason for Vince releasing Braun, then like if, this is all due respect, like I'm not trying to say anything, but if you are willing to let go of a guy that has been in your company on the main roster uh, since 2015, and you are deciding him, you are deciding to let him go over someone who just came to the main roster, I don't know. I don't think that's a, a very safe bet. But, um, well, and I like going on just referencing to that, like, Omas hasn't impressed me with his showmanship, which Braun had more character behind him. Yeah. Um, I get it from a salary cap perspective, like any sports team would, uh, like the Jacksonville Jaguars 
you can, you only have so much room to, to pay people. So if you have somebody who's asking for too much money, you maybe cut them and get two cheaper people. But it, it just felt weird. It felt oddly, oddly timed. So I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there is really no excuse why any of these men or women should have been released. Because, again, it's like if in due time you had the proper booking and you sort of took those steps to put everybody into meaningful storylines, I don't, I don't see why these people needed to get cut. Maybe other people who weren't on TV for months at this point should have been cut. And that's always been my thing is that if someone is not being used, yeah, cut them. Get them out because you're hanging on to them for whatever reason and that, that doesn't allow for them to go somewhere else and like improve their craft. But for the Braun Strowmans, uh, A-Lister Blacks, for the Lanas that we did see on TV over the last few weeks and at this point sort of had a sweet spot in, in, in everybody's heart, it's like... I don't, I don't really see the reasoning behind it. And even if Braun was demanding money, I mean, the guy has been with the company for a few years. He's a formal universal champion. I'm not saying that the second somebody wants a promotion, they, they need to get it. But it's, I'm sure that if, if they really wanted to cut a deal with the guy, they could have. So, yeah, I don't, I don't understand. And to be honest, like, yeah, there is a surplus and there are people that you need to get rid of, but I wouldn't give up people like Braun Strowman and A-Lister Black that easily. I would try to like mend fences and try to like reach like have a like a little uh meet them in the middle meeting um just to see if a deal can be sorted out, but I don't know. I guess the old man thinks that this is what's best for business, part of the pun. Um <clears throat> but uh but yeah, we go from the, the roster to, I very quickly want to dabble into, you know, because we're talking about talent, we're talking about not so good booking. I want to take a second to address the uh, like other companies outside of the WWE. So I know that Kamish has sent you no- notes down. So if you want to knock that out first, and then we can give our respective opinions. Yes. Uh, All Elite Wrestling. New Japan Pro Wrestling, Ring of Honor, and all the other competing companies have all tried to get along with each other and have great working relationships that, that are working in their favor while being able to support the talent that is spread all throughout their brands. If WWE could open the floodgates already, things would work out in their favor and possibly bring back the fan that I once was wholeheartedly. It breaks my heart that I'm even writing this because if I were to have said this, you wouldn't. Uh, you would have heard the disdain in my voice. So from there, you hear that he he's disillusioned, and we've talked about this time and time again with the the different companies. You saw, like, we'll just use uh, Kenny Omega as the as the poster boy of this. He had four championships, and those championships spanned several of the companies. Yeah. Uh so you have a partnership among most of these groups, and it, it almost feels like they're putting a nail in. They're putting the nail in WWE's coffin because WWE has spread themselves so so thin and so lazy with their NXT, NXT UK, SmackDown, Raw. Um, I, I feel like there's something else that I'm forgetting, but they don't. They, they haven't put in the work to focus their, their, their themselves and center themselves and have a core product to build around, to rally around. Meanwhile, you have four or five other companies who crisscross here and there, and you've got so much talent that's influxing over there. You've got, uh, just, you've got veterans in the form of Paul White and Mark Henry, Chris Jericho, you have Andrade, who just jumped over to AEW. Yeah. Uh, Kenny Omega, the Young Bucks, uh, Hangman Page, um, all of those people. And and this new wave of releases is just going to bolster some of those companies even more. Um, because you might get, like, because I, I saw something today that said that some people in WWE are already like, oh, we should bring Alistair, <laughs> Alistair back. 
And it's like, then you shouldn't have fired him in the first place, dummies. But if you get an Alistair Black and a Murphy over into one of these companies, you can have them spotlight. Yes. And if Braun still wants to wrestle instead of focusing on something else for the time being, he can also be a gigantic name for them to sign on somewhere. Yeah. Oh. Eh, the WWE is faltering, man. They're 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 basic. They're against the ropes, and these other companies are they're winding up that knockout punch. So maybe WWE has just sort of transitioned, and if the rumors of them potentially just selling off to NBC are the the case, maybe they're kind of shooting themselves in the foot because they don't care. <laughs> yeah, I know that one of the cheesy expressions is that WWE is always changing with the times. And I know that back during the early millennium, we were kind of uh, not exactly in the same situation, but, uh, you know, back then on TV programming or whatever, you could never say WCW. You could never bring up ECW because these were rival companies. You could never bring up TNA or else you would get fined or suspended or whatnot. And I think that if WWE really was changing with the times, like, that's the thing, too, is, like, I guess I'll segue into this now where we're talking about other companies and everybody kind of joining forces. I watched AEW uh, Double or Nothing, and, again, you see all this talent. Yeah, granted, half of which was former WWE superstars, but that, besides the point, all of their storylines were in that two, two and a half hour pay-per-view. Everybody was on the card. Everybody that needed to be on the card was on the card. Um, yeah, and not everybody who was, a, who was a main event player was in the main event, but they participated somehow. And yeah. you see Kenny Omega walking around with the five championships. I literally thought to myself and I said, can you imagine if, if, WWE is quote unquote trying to do budget cuts because well there isn't enough budget or there isn't enough money being made. Can you imagine the amount of money they could make if they start having interpromotional pay-per-views or interpromotional matches with say someone from an AEW versus someone from a WWE? And it's like the, the dream matches, the, the, like the numbers that you can draw from just that alone, even if you are doing it from a Silver Dome or, or a, not Silver Dome, uh, from the Thunder Dome, or you're doing it from, you know, no audience or whatever, which at this point, we're kind of going back to regular, you know, lifestyle. But think about all the numbers that you could draw. And I think that all these other companies have that foresight of, hey, instead of trying to put each other out of business, um, because that's sort of the motto, you know, from 15, 20 years ago, it's like, why don't we just take a chance to work together and, and everybody profits, everybody makes money. Um, and one thing that I just, I really have to bring up because it, it, it kills me inside. Um, I don't know if you saw Double or Nothing, Dan. I don't know if you saw the Sting match that uh, took place. No. I did not. Well, let's just say Sting looked very, very good in that match. So much so that there was a spot where he gets suplexed on the outside and he quickly gets right back up. Yeah. And this guy is pushing 60 some odd years old. And he's even gone on record of saying, I wanted to do the Undertaker match. But WWE, for whatever reason, would push me aside and say, no, you're, you're done. Like, it's good. Not necessary. And I just feel like that's a vi another big problem with WWE too is they, they, they are so scripted. They are so heavily based on what, what's on the paper as opposed to what does the audience want? What's going to make well, money? And, and they're riddled with pettiness. Like just going using Sting as the reference, Sting lost every match he had, didn't he? He won a tag team match, but that one is kind of, like oh. doesn't really get remembered too often. But, but he, he lost all of the, the main the main matches, which right. it was like WWE finally got their hands on that lucrative guy, and then they just said, "Oh, right, cool, we're gonna feed him to Triple H and, and Seth." Which, that was it. Which, by the way, you're right. I like that word that you brought up, the pettiness, because. I feel like that Triple H match was supposed to be the final nail in the coffin of, even though it was 20 years after the fact, 
WWE beat WCW and JBL, who was on commentary for that match, was hitting that at home every 15 seconds. But continue. Well, I mean, that was that was the crux of it. But yeah, and now now they they hurt like they hurt him, and then they release him. I guess probably from his Legends deal, and he heads over to uh, he's in AEW, and he's back in the ring. Yeah. So. He clearly wasn't hurt that bad, but then WWE just did that, like, all right, well, we're just going to shut it down type of thing. Right. And um, the, the the interesting thing for me is, you're right, WWE could very easily, oh, and this was something that they could have even done back in the Monday Night Wars, but I'm assuming that it was the two of the two companies didn't, didn't want to do it. They were fighting for supremacy. Yeah. But... You have an enti- you have a, a very specific fan base that follows all those other companies, and they're not watching WWE. But if WWE went ahead and opened the opened the door and said, "Okay, fine, we'll play," and everybody just kind of interspersed, and you had like like you have their own rosters, but you occasionally do those crossovers, then guess what? You're gonna get an influx of new viewers, but. Obviously, you still have to put in the work, and you've got to you've got to put out a good product. And I also think that mm, to to go back to what Kamish likes to steer to, and you'll hear it in his closeout paragraph. Vince is very set in his ways. Yeah. Vince doesn't like to mm, play ball. He doesn't like to concede to anybody. So, if the conversation came to be where it was, hey, uh, what do you think about putting? Roman against uh, against a Kenny Omega, he'd be like, "Well, Roman's gonna win." Mm, but does he? Does he have? Does he have to win? Yep, he's my guy. He's got to win. Okay, then maybe we don't want to do this because it it isn't even a conversation. Yeah. And if they ultimately do end up selling the, selling the company, the fascinating thing here, and I'm I'm jumping ahead on this. I feel like it goes to one of two ways because I don't. I if NBC ultimately becomes the owner of WWE, hypothetically, I I don't think Vince stays in a prominent role. I just don't think it happens because I think that they're going to say, okay, well, we're going to buy this and we're going to do it our way, and they might keep somebody like Triple H. Since he knows the business, they might keep him as a consulting executive or something. But they might just turn the whole thing over and and say, okay, well, Vince, you're out. Triple H, thanks for coming. Stephanie, bye-bye. And try to build and rebuild from the ground up. I don't know what happens yeah. if, that ha- if that ends up being a thing. But I don't know if it's going to be good. <laughs> well... I'm going to be honest, I, w- this is something else that we've also hammered home almost every single episode that we've recorded, is that if you ask me, the solution is right in front of their faces, and that, that seems to be another common theme, is a lot of times the answer to the question is right in front of their faces, but they don't want to acknowledge it. If you want WWE to change and be a better product, you got to hand the keys over to Triple H. I have said that and I will always say that because for anybody who thinks that, who thinks differently, I honestly invite you to just go and watch any episode of NXT. Go watch a takeover and you will see that instantly it's, it's different. Everything is different. The presentation, the mannerisms, the character building, the storylines that they tell, everything is different. And you do have occasions where, like right now, I'm not really following it episode by episode, but there's a deal with Ted DiBiase coming in and kind of contributing to a storyline. And yeah. it's like, if you really look at it, and I don't know, maybe you agree, maybe you disagree, Dan, but every time when a Raw or a SmackDown brings back something vintage, like a Starcade or something from back in the day, it's a mockery. But when NXT does it, like a Halloween Havoc or a In Your House, you feel like that tradition of classical professional wrestling is still carried out. Like, it's not a gimmick. It's superstars going out there and trying to tell a story. 
I don't know. How do you feel about that? Or do you feel like anything that, whether it's NXT or main roster, that gets put together, which sort of like pays a tribute to something from back in the day, is just a, a complete mockery? Um, they're always caricatures of themselves. So, yeah. Any, uh, more often than not, when, you, when they decide to reference something or revitalize something... Um, a lot of times it's 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 BS. Like NXT Takeover in your house is just a branding thing, so that one kind of escapes. But if you bring back specific segments, you bring back specific people. Um, they always find a way to taint them. Yeah, and I I do think that that is a, a key difference between. Uh, main roster and NXT, the one thing I will um, attribute to Triple H that is not necessarily positive is that I think he shares some degree of the same sense of humor as Vince does. Do I think he has a a better, younger uh, brain on his shoulders? Yeah. So do I think that he he can keep a divide between humoring himself and actually trying to build a better product? Yeah, probably. It's just whether or not if they end up hand, handing the keys over to somebody else, if NBC, who I'm just going to keep using as the example, if NBC decides to keep him as the top guy because he knows stuff, or if they say, all right, well, let's go outside. And who knows? Maybe they end up with a Vince Russo. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I will say this. If it's any consolation, I am not a fan of the transfer to Peacock for the WWE Network. Um, I just feel like it doesn't have the same fluidity, and there are certain things that just don't sit well with me. So if that's any consolation of NBC buying out what's left of WWE, then I don't know. Going back to your point, it can go one of two ways. Where do we see the product going? Where do we want the product to go from here? So as usual, if you want to read the commission's notes, and then we can take it from there. Yes. So his final thing we've kind of already talked about, but it says, So here's an idea, Mr. McMahon. Give the company to your son-in-law, Paul, and let him do to the WWE what he's done to NXT, and I'm sure all the other promotions could give you five-star quality matches. Matches that have been seen in the indies and matches that we all could do nowadays is <laughs> and matches that all we can do nowadays is dream about. So, yeah, he, he basically these these other places are they're putting in the work. Do I think that the market's a little oversaturated right now? Sure, because let's just name the places: New New Japan, AEW, WWE. Ring of Honor, uh, AA, uh, Triple A. There's like there, there's and and that's just like the name the name brand ones because you've got things like like is Shimmer still a thing? I'm not sure. I don't know. You've got a bunch of other other smaller things, yeah. uh, but it, there's just a lot of places, and I don't know how much money there actually is in any of it to warrant having seven primary promotions yeah i think that like i know this gets thrown around all the time but it truly is a unique time to be a wrestling fan because you have so many options whereas opposed to back in the day even if we're talking about the major leagues you really didn't have a whole lot like wwe was the staple but i feel like now there's all these other companies that are slowly becoming you know more uh famous more notorious you know, they're drawing eyeballs and, you know, everybody is checking them out, especially with social media now, you know, that really start that starts getting the word around. But um, in regards to future, I mean, I'm going to be completely honest. I don't see anything but a gradual decline um, unless if there is a shift in management. I'm not I'm not talking about like in storyline or anything. I'm talking about like you know, uh, Vince McMahon stepping down and handing the company over because, uh, like I said, I at first thought that, okay, there's a pandemic going on in the background, so everybody is suffering, but then I see AEW and I'm like, wow, these guys are getting their storylines in, everybody has a spot on the card, 
So it's not just the pandemic. It's the fact that people in AEW seem to care about what they're, you know, that what they're putting out there for all their audiences. So, yeah, I, I, I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, I feel like there is a, there's hope or that things are going to get better. I personally don't see it. Even if they do, it's probably going to be a very slow build uh, because uh, mainly you have things like storylines that even when they do have something good, I feel they find a way to screw it up. And I think a, a prime example of that is, I guess I'll bring it full circle, you talked about the Alexa Bliss Fiend and Randy Orton storyline. I thought that everything was great, that it was the most entertaining thing on TV. And then we got to WrestleMania and they just turned the stove down big time. Like they, they, they just, they, they killed everything that they, that they had built up for over the last two, three months, whatever it was. So, I don't know, you know, and you see a lot of repetitive matches now, matches that we've seen a hundred times before, promos seem very stale and dull and not believable, um, people getting released left, right, and center, so I don't know, I don't really have too many high hopes, I'm still going to continue watching because at my core, I'm still a WWE fan, and at the end of the day, Despite the fact that I spend time bashing it, I always want what's best for WWE, but uh, I stand by what I've been saying this whole time, that unless Vince McMahon steps down, then things are going to continue this way, and they probably are going to get worse. So, yeah, that's just my final remarks about that. I'm, uh, I'm generally in agreement. I will make final comments, and be done with it. Um, the only thing that I think is going to save this uh, and professional wrestling all in all is a shift of leadership within this company and opening the door to uh, working with the other ones because I think that overall interest has been on a decline for a, for a minute and it's mostly their fault. But if they don't do that and just sort of shuffle and revitalize the fan base because if you're not if you're not now shifting to leech fans at least temporarily from the other companies to borrow them and keep yourself going you're literally bleeding yourself to death so they need to adapt they need to grow and they need to uh what sets thing Re- rebuild redesign reclaim I, I, I don't know, because really I feel like WWE has all the talent that they could possibly want or need. You hear it all the time. Everybody says that this era of wrestling has the most talented performers in the history. Of course. Um, but I don't know. We, we, we see all the releases. Uh, we see the the BS booking that all these superstars are forced to, you know, deal with. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't see it going up anytime soon. Like I said, I still feel like we're going to be on a decline, but, um, I hope I'm wrong. Honestly, I hope I'm wrong. Only time will tell, but, uh, yeah, these are just my remarks. And, uh, Dan, if you have anything else that you want to, close with nah I'm square man alright well with all that said guys uh, let us know what you guys think in the comment section below what do you think about the current product of WWE what do you think about all these other uh, major league wrestling companies that are now slowly having interpromotional uh, battles feuds storylines built in let us know what you guys think in the comment section below. Once again, thank you so much for joining us for another episode. On behalf of myself, Dan the Man, and the Commish, even though he's not here, uh, we hope that everybody is safe out there with everything going on in the world. Once again, thank you so much for joining us, and we will see you all next week.